working years behind me, but I was more than a little dislocated, unable to comprehend the half of it, and caught in the strange position of having to explain myself to the public. It became so tense and so important to win the public that I promptly did the wrong thing. I scowled before the TV news cameras. <laughs> this was not at all the way it was in Marcos's time when a military general threatened me with a multi-million peso suit because by his reckoning I had vexed him and ruined his good name. The exact amount is lost to me. It was either five million or 10 million. But what I do remember, Saul, you remember? 10 million, Saul says, our chronicler. <laughs> But what I do remember is that the article in Panorama magazine had paid me a very sumptuous fee of 250 pesos before taxes. <laughs> With the general's lawsuit, however, I did not feel that bad. True, I was terrified for an entire whole full day because I had already been locked up in a Marcos prison at age 23 and I had no intentions of having history repeat itself. But after being terrified, I just knew I had to keep alert and nothing more. I had written that the general was in command of soldiers who swooped down a tribal village and burnt huts to the ground in Kimananao, in the cold recesses of the Pakibato Mountains. And I was sure of my facts. I had gone to the area myself. I had probed the Datus and the church workers. I had lived with the tribe's people. I had with me the photographs of the charred huts taken by Father Jack Walsh, the only soul I could find willing to brave the four-hour trek with me. See, it was shoot to kill at nightfall in those mountains when roving paramilitary groups scoured the area, so we had to try and beat the setting sun by walking nearly nonstop. I was thus blessed to find this big American Marinol priest based in Davao who was willing to risk getting shot, and I knew that if anything happened, I would definitely get the extreme unction. <laughs> Thinking back, I understand now why I did not feel strange going up against the general. I did not need to win over the public at all. I could leave the article to speak for itself. People knew that this kind of burning happened. I was on the side of good, and the public knew it. Claudine, in mid-2000, was a bright and shining star. The public adored her. And after her many goody-two-shoes roles on TV and her long-suffering but heroic characters on the big screen, she could do no wrong. As yet, there were no airport incidents recorded by cell phone cameras. <laughs> she had also mastered the art of the camera. She never scowled at it. Instead, whenever she spoke against me on TV, she wore a little pained smile. She was perfect. <laughs> so there I was, looking for all the world like a bully. I felt alone. The millions who adored this star, who mixed up the image with the reality, the star with the human being, those millions did not know me. They had no reason to give me the benefit of the doubt. I was just a skill joy writer sewing back a famous movie star and for libel too. I sued because I knew I had not been dishonest nor irresponsible. When I gathered the stories about Rico Yan and revealed the grief she had caused him before his death. As court witness, I had former Senator Bobby Tanyada who took the trouble of appearing before the prosecutor of the Quezon City Regional Trial Court to testify that I had been maligned on television by the star. <clears throat> In other words, I fought back, but the fallout was unbelievable. My having studied at St. Teresa's College and Mary Knoll were used against me in tabloid columns. Those who always wanted to knock me and Yes Magazine down used the case to write against me. Even my writing and speaking in English were used against me. And my non-connection to any of the big camps, Viva, ABS-CBN, Regal, GMA7, was seen as a weakness, a weakness and used against me. I was the wicked witch of the East at a time when Broadway had not yet given the wicked witch a good name. <laughs> I 
I realized then that whatever your beat, you're going to get it. You want to be a journalist? Be prepared to get it. If you keep writing and editing and making commentary, you will produce a ton of work and you are bound to irritate somebody. But as a journalist is not in the business of being popular, you just plod on, telling the story the best way you can. The most recent star that did not like me was Richard Gutierrez. He believed I had ruined his image with something reported in pep.ph, the entertainment portal I am also editor of, and he sued. Despite the fact that I investigated my reporter's post, it had been activated on a Sunday evening when a skeletal staff was on board. Within seconds of the complaint, despite the fact that I concluded he had reason to gripe and withdrew the post within an hour of its posting, despite the fact that I posted a proper apology within 24 hours of the posting, and despite the fact that within 48 hours, I had called for a tri-media conference where I once again apologized for my reporter and his report, the guy still sued. Call it ego, he sued. Although these suits happened three years apart, one thing Claudine and Richard had in common was that they belonged to the two biggest television networks when they sued me. This posed the immediate danger that their suits would drive a wedge between their networks on the one hand and the magazine and the website I handled on the other. If the danger escalated, we could lose access to the other big stars of these networks, which had already become the biggest star makers in the land and still are. We were cooked. The two stars also had between them a retinue of writers, handlers, managers, gophers, assistants, and noisy mothers with tremendous reach. <laughs> they, they could saturate all of tabloid, magazine, and broadsheet with reports, blind items, jokes, brickbats, and sly digs that could make an editor look like a really bad person. I was cooked. I had to move and move fast. In the case of Claudine, I invited to my home a number of independent showbiz reporters, meaning they were not beholden to Claudine's network, to explain my side. Following that, I kept each one updated about the suits and counter suits. Following that, I sent personal text messages intermittently to show my good intentions. It was all hard work. If they could not write the truth about the star, they would at least not write untruths about the writer. This became a real war, one fought in the courts, which could milk the magazine dry of 50 million easily, and one fought in the media, which could ruin any reputation I might have had. It was a war that wasted good energy and lasted more than two years. In the case of Richard, I could get more sympathy from the reporters, but none of these reporters could actually write about my side. They were too scared of Richard's mother. <laughs> and, and that's the truth. And so I learned <clears throat> another truth about showbiz reporting. Courage is, at times, in short supply. But truth to tell, this is also the same thing that is, at times, in short supply in any beat. It has come to be that if anyone asks what I admire most in a journalist, I would go past nose for news, accuracy, networking, or industry. I would go straight to courage. All the years of writing under testy social, political, cultural environments had come to this. I was being sued in cases that could land me in jail and ruin my name, but even my friends were not taking my dilemma seriously. They would if, I were, if it were a general I was up against. But a movie star, they thought the matter hilarious. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was not hilarious to me. See, a suit from a famous movie person has the twisted power of ruining a journalist before the public in a way that a suit from a wedding lord can never do. Who believes in wedding lords? But millions believe in movie stars. Just count how many movie stars have been elected as counselors, provincial board members, mayors, governors, congressmen, senators, vice presidents, and presidents. I say, go up against a big star and no public displeasure. This is a paradox of celebrity journalism. 
Everyone reads your magazine, but they will always say they only chanced on it in the parlor or the dermas. <laughs> Everyone wants to know what's happening to Maricel and Gerald, to Maha and Kim, to Sunshine and Cesar, but no one will write out, admit it. Everyone will ask what will make it sound like they're only after a short, fun break in the dinner talk. Some people buy the magazine in the supermarket, but put Vogue on top of it at the payout counter. <laughs> CEOs and COOs always precede full-scale showbiz prattle in their off hours with a nervous laugh or a feigned nonchalance. No one even expects you to behave like a journalist on this beat. People dismiss the beat as of no meaning or worth in the scheme of things, so they also dismiss any expectations of you or your work. And yet, you know that the only way you can do good work on the entertainment beat is to respect it. To treat the star, the film, the contract, the controversy, the intrigue, and the issue with a fairness expected of any journalist. Fairness, of course, means context. You must show rigor in uncovering the history of the beat, the track record of its main players, the anecdotal proofs, the esoteric language, the dynamics, the internal politics, the ties that bind the general culture. Because you deal here with real life stories that have captured the imagination of a people interested in people. And you will get into trouble because in respecting this beat, you will show the pretty and the ugly. You will want to show up the false gods. You will not print the press release. You will not feed the image. You will want to tell it as it is and to make sense of a world at once real and unreal. So when you get ostracized, when you're sued, when you get no respect, what do you do? Well, again, you just plod on. Your being a journalist will kick in. You will not go lazy on the subject. You will not use your magazine as a personal pulpit. You will not scheme and plot against anyone. You will not, you will report on your beat as best you know how, as fair as you know how. You will insist on looking at showbiz for what it is a real part of the landscape of our arts and literature, a wild and wooly part of the mix of movie, stage, performers, stars, storytelling, drama, and comedy, and satire, the very narrative of our culture. I look at this beat I've covered for the last 13 years, and I believe I did not do too badly. Every one of those more than 3,000 covers I can live with. Every one of those issues I worked on as a journalist. And showbiz reporting, I have to tell you, is not an easy ride. For one thing, the showbiz community is a very tight, closed one. When I'm being fanciful, I actually say it's incestuous. Everyone is the ex of somebody. It's ninang to somebody's baby, ninang to somebody's wedding. They intermarry, they attend each other's parties, wakes and awards nights. They take cruises together, they have intersecting groupies and stylists and managers. Everyone seems to be connected. So if a reporter gets into trouble with someone, she will probably get into trouble with everyone. In showbiz too, you deal with multi-million peso investments. A star is a multi-million peso investment. His movie, his record, his teleseria, his talk show, these are all investments that the industry players will protect at all costs, including the cost of truth. So you are up against a whole infrastructure that will try and crush you if you do not play the game, making each issue a major issue of courage. And yes, too, showbiz is a guilty pleasure. I've thought about this one and I've come to the conclusion that this state of affairs is both good and bad. Good because we are conscious that there are so many things going on in life, family, money, career, environment, spirituality, inequality, injustice, that there's barely any time to apply ourselves to all these. We'd like to volunteer to Gawad Kalinga. We'd like to get our hoard of blankets and jackets and bring them to the fire-raised areas in Tondo that the news had just reported on. We'd like to put in hours in Don Bosco's outreach work where all they want is for us to physically be there for an hour to talk to people who want to hear from somebody who is schooled. We'd like to rescue more abused animals, lobby for dog pounds with a mandate not to euthanize, but to work for adoption and spaying. 
would like to provide air conditioners to all orphanages, especially for the baby rooms. We want to be useful. We want to mean something, to be bigger than our wants and desires. I know I do. So yes, it is good that showbiz is a guilty pleasure. At the same time, it is bad. Because this mindset often also means that we haven't quite understood that showbiz, movie stars, movies, plays, performers, the creative craziness, the full run of culture is part of what makes us whole. Our taste and sensibility, our jokes, our language, these reflect the kind of society we have. We are not just debate, although reviewing movies can be a great debate. We are not just political literature, although reconstructing the whole business of showbiz stars, getting into politics would make for interesting political literature. We are not just any one thing. We are many things put together. No, same in, no shame in saying that showbiz is part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I was assigned to speak on this subject of navigating lawsuits, but Ceres and Joan could have spoken in it or some other journalists here. But uh, let me share um, my experiences with you. For journalists, there's always a first time for libel suits. This is usually a memorable event, perhaps like a first kiss or a first date. <laughs> Mine was in the late 80s. I was 30 years old or so then, so you know how old I am now, when I was a contributor to the Manila Chronicle. I wrote that what I thought was an innocuous story on a senatorial candidate today. Guess who? It's a she. Ting Ting Kohuanko, relative of then President Cory Aquino. I wrote about her and her foray into Mindanao politics and business. What stung her about the article was a reference to her as the barter trade queen. This phrase was in quotes, and I picked it up from sources in Mindanao. Uh, again, for those who were not born yet at the time, uh, barter trade means uh, there was a lot of exchange of goods between people in Sulu, Tawi-Tawi, and Saba. Very relevant today. At the time, Ms. Kowanko was a highly visible public figure, and as I said, she's running for the Senate now. <laughs> so it came as a shock when she filed a libel suit which eventually reached the Supreme Court. Ms. Kohuanko wanted the lower court to issue an HDO. Remember HDO, whole departure order, and stop me from traveling overseas. At the time, I was set to leave for my 10-month postgraduate scholarship in London. I had a very good pro bono lawyer, Francis Hardeleza, who is now Solicitor General. I don't think he'll deny this. He elevated, we elevated our case to the Supreme Court. The justices allowed me to leave the country. It was a sweet victory. I learned lessons which I've taken to heart since then, to be very careful about quotes, to always verify information with trusted sources, and never to take reporting for granted. This way you lessen the chances for frivolous lawsuits. But a few years later, despite being faithful to all these tenets, another libel suit hit me. This time, a mega wealthy businessman sued me for 20 million pesos. At the time, in the early 1990s, it was the most expensive libel suit ever filed. The Manila bureau chief of the Far Eastern Economic Review and I wrote a cover story for the magazine on the plunder of Palawan's forests. I think my colleague knew that Pepito Alvarez, the logging magnate with vast concession in Palawan, I think he knew that Pepito would take legal action because he timed the story to be published on the eve of his departure from Manila to take a new post overseas. <laughs> so I was left alone to face the consequences. Fortunately, the editor-in-chief of the review was very supportive. He flew to Manila from Hong Kong to assure me that the magazine would hire a lawyer and foot the bill. Eventually, the case was dismissed. Postscript, Alvarez has left the logging business and moved to car manufacturing here and in Vietnam. We've since spoken to each other. 
These two experiences prepared me for the libel suits that were filed against Newsbreak, of which I was editor-in-chief. Always, the editor-in-chief is included in these lawsuits, even if we did not write the stories. Among those who sued us were Juan Ponce and Rile, Chavit Singson, and Robert Barbers. And Rile decided to settle the case without any apology from us and agreed to a lifetime subscription of Newsbreak magazine <laughs> as payment for damages, sort of. Well, Newsbreak has died and Envile is still alive. <laughs> Who would know that he would live much longer than our little magazine? Barbers died before the case was resolved and we've been in touch with his sons and agreed to move the proceedings to a mediation court. Chavit Singson is the last holdout. He refuses to talk to us despite feelers sent through emissaries. And he filed the libel case in Vigan, Ilocosur, his territory. Our request to transfer venue to a Metro Manila court is still pending with the Supreme Court. Today, I'm happy to say I'm certified libel free, almost, not counting Chavit's revenge. Last year, Supreme Court Justice Presbytero Velasco dropped the two libel cases he filed against me. This is because I decided to write a book that would look at the inner workings of the court. It was the first of its kind, and I had hoped to make the court more transparent. So in 2010, uh, as we were preparing to launch Shadow of Doubt, I received calls and text messages that Velasco had filed a 13-count libel case against me. 13 because initially, the story I pu was published in a website for 13 days. So he had no idea that uh, it's just one story. <laughs> so this was the first time in the Philippines that a sitting justice had filed a libel suit versus a journalist. I assume that this reaction of a justice was due to the fact that this was the first time that a uh, book pierced the cocoon of the court. Moreover, he, like other personalities, do not take accountability seriously. They do bad things and they expect to get away with this. Last year, as I was working on the sequel to Shadow of Doubt, R Before Dawn, and as the impeachment trial of Chief Justice Renato Corona was nearing its end, we received the good news. Velasco decided to drop the libel suits. I think he saw the handwriting on the wall. By that time, the evidence against Corona was overwhelming and his conviction was just a matter of time. Two days after Corona was convicted, we had a lunch. I had a lunch with uh, Velasco. He invited me rather to lunch. He explained to me in a one-on-one -on -one meeting at a hotel restaurant, our lawyers were at another table seated beside us. He said that the cases had become a bother, they, had con they were consuming a lot of his time, and that he decided to uh, take this out of his busy schedule. I'm sorry for filing these cases, he said, catching me by surprise. I did not expect this powerful figure, a boss to 2,000 judges, to humble himself. I listened as he let out his hurt feelings, especially, he said, when I referred to him as a, in quotes, practicing justice. <laughs> but before this lunch, my lawyer advised me, said, Marites, you have to apologize. I said, I cannot apologize because I, I wrote what I, what the truth. And my lawyer said, no, just apologize for causing him distress. <laughs> so I followed my lawyer's advice and I said, sir, I'm sorry for causing you distress and sleepless nights. That conversation ended two years of court filings and appearances. Finally, my run-in with the court was over. To conclude, how does it feel to be sued? After reading Velasco's affidavits, I felt like I was the worst journalist in this part of the world. I'm glad I still have my self-esteem. It can be unnerving and disorienting, but that comes with the territory. And how does one defend herself faced with libel suits by writing the facts and the truth. I believe the stories will speak for themselves, and if they are sensitive, it's always good to consult a lawyer to go over the manuscripts before publication. And of course, it's important to get good, 
pro bono lawyers. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll spend so much money because they're billed per hour. <laughs> Through the years, I've learned that no matter the care you put into a story, they, may, they will still hurt some people and make them angry. These angry people threaten and sue for libel. If that's the consequence, I'll choose this kind of controversy anytime over opaque reporting. After all, journalism is not about making nice to people. It's not about seeking to be good, to be on the good side of the powerful. It's about telling a story straight, unvarnished. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much to our three speakers. We have a few minutes for some questions from our audience, especially from the students who are walking away. <laughs> Give your name and Hi, your, set, um, your year level. Um, my name is Regine Cabato. I'm from ABCOM Communications. Um, I was listening to all your stories earlier, and I would say that as an aspiring journalist, um, I find your stories um, really inspiring. Um, so that said, as journalists, I do admire that you speak quite strongly against corruption, against human rights abuses, against all these issues that are considered you know, taboo to speak of at the given point in time that you, know, you reported on these. Now, um, I'm pretty sure, and I guess especially given the um, culture of the media and the po all the politicking in this country, that at one point you may have been offered to say otherwise or not to say anything at all. My question is, how do you say no? Um, are you addressing this in particular to, um, do I have to, to anyone in general? My answer is, no one has offered me anything. Ang takot lang nila. Would the other writers like to answer? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, given the patriarchal society present in the Philippines, do you think that you, as writers, being female, has affected in any way your fellow writers have viewed your work or your readers have viewed your work? Nagtuturoan kami kung kung anong kung sino ang sasagot. You know, honestly, hindi ko naman napapansin kung ano ang epekto, kung kanino, at lahat. Uh, napansin ko nga lang na nung nag kami na women, uh, merong common language kagad, may common sensibility. So siguro, pari, pati rin sa mga babae sa labas, guro malaking bagay din yung kapwa-babae ang nagsusulat o kapwa-babae ang nag interview Pero parang Ayaw ko namang limitahin ang sarili ko sa ganoon. Parang tingin ko, eh bilib na bilib naman ako sa asawa ko, no? Lalaki 'yon. So <laughs> so parang ayaw ko namang bawasan 'yon kasi parang why, you know? Parang I really don't want to make it an issue this gender thing. But maybe the more feminist among us can say something else, but me as I swear, it doesn't really doesn't get into my consciousness when I write. <laughs> 